Play Coup and the Train with the key network station in Saigon, Vietnam. If you leave Vietnam on emergency orders, do not report to an Army replacement battalion. You should report directly to the Army ATCO desk at your nearest air terminal. You must have your emergency leave orders from your parent unit with you. Reporting to the replacement battalion or failing to have emergency leave orders will only delay your departure. The intense fighting of the Tet Offensive, as in any battle, leaves a trail of wounded in its wake. Tending to these wounded heroes are always the field medics and nurses. Vietnam was no exception. While much focus is put on the men going to Vietnam through either enlisting or in the draft, approximately 7,484 women served in the war. 83.5% or 6,250 served as nurses in field hospitals. These nurses served in Navy hospital ships, on Air Force airlift helicopters, and in Army field hospitals. We had a saying that if you, if you got, to our, got to the hospital, you had a 99% chance of surviving, surviving Vietnam. Now, what happened to these individuals when they went down the chain of command, whether they died of complications later, we wouldn't know. But we were able to stabilize them and keep them alive if we got you 90% of the time. And we were very proud of that. The Vietnam War is the first to use helicopters to transport the wounded and dying to receive medical care. And hospitals were situated to take these wounded soldiers and civilians brought in by airlift. We were in Quinyan, which is a city on the, on the uh, ocean, or South China Sea. The army was very proud to say that if you were uh, wounded out in the field, that you were only 15 minutes away from medical care. So you went to the nearest medical facility, which could be in a back hospital, a clearing company, or a mass unit. Then a couple times a week, I was in a VAC hospital, what, we would have what was called a regurge from the surge which meant all the choppers would come in with patients who were in other areas. And sometimes our OR would be running up to 72 hours because they would come through our triage area, go to pre-op, then they would go to surgery, then they would go to post-op, then they would go to the units, to the nursing units. After that, after a few days, if they were stabilized, the Air Force would came in, come in and evacuated them to Japan or the Philippines or Guam. So it was steady flow of patients. You would maybe know a patient for three or four days and that was it. The combat nurses regularly worked 12-hour shifts, six days a week, serving not only the soldiers brought in from battle, but also volunteering and administering medical aid to the local South Vietnamese population. Their schedules are physically and psychologically grueling as they were often overtaxed at the end of major battles. We worked 12 hours, seven days a week, 7 a.m., 7 p.m., or 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. You go get supper or breakfast, whatever, and then you go to bed, get up and do it all over again. And you just, your main job was to take care of the soldiers, the casualties as they came in. As the war starts in 1965, there are only 113 hospital beds and 15 nurses in South Vietnam. By 1968, the buildup of medical units is completed, adding 11 reserve and National Guard units. 900 nurses are serving 23 Army hospitals and one convalescent center, with a total of 5,283 beds. Nurses average 23 years of age, with only 35% of them having more than two years' experience. 79% are women, and 21% are male nurses. As these nurses enter their 12-month tour of service, they are flown directly to the Tan Son Nut Air Base before processing for their assignments. Most field hospitals are located on large airfields in close proximity to division headquarters or troop concentrations. Due to their vulnerability in the war zone, hospitals were not always spared from the ravages of war. Because of this, they are heavily guarded. We weren't close to the front lines, but a lot of times the front lines would come to us. Sometimes the VC would uh, surround Quinyon, 
we would be on alert. We would have to go to uh, our hospital unit. We would go on the floors, take care of the patients. The, met, they, the armory would break out the M16s, give to the medics. The medics would form a perimeter. Luckily, while I was there, we didn't have any problem. We weren't overrun. The patients, of course, were upset. I would tell them, don't worry. If they don't put a gun in my hand, we're safe. <laughs> don't worry until they put that M16 in my hand, boys. Many nurses wear light olive cotton fatigues rather than a traditional white uniform. Their service goes beyond the battlefield and armed forces as army nurses regularly move out to clinics established for the civilian population, providing immunization and basic medical care. They also conduct sick calls to Vietnamese homes and orphanages. Usually if you had to travel a distance, you went in chopper, but you could look down. And if you're on a river, if you follow the river, you can see oxen and that type of thing. You can see people out in the field picking rice, conical hats, etc. You, you can see, see the Vietnamese community. Battlefield injuries are actually outnumbered by disease and infections, marking 69% of all admissions. The unforgiving environment and warfare leave soldiers to struggle with infection caused by flying debris, as well as battlefield injuries from explosions and gunfire. Advances in medical technology since World War II results in shorter hospital stays, as well as a lower mortality rate amongst patients, 2.6% per thousand over the 4.5% of the World War II era. What we won when all of our people united just must not now be lost in suspicion and distrust and selfishness and politics among any of our people. And believing this as I do, I have concluded that I should not permit the presidency to become involved in the partisan divisions that are developing in this political year. With American sons in the field far away, with America's future under challenge right here at home, with our hopes and the world's hopes for peace and the balance every day, I do not believe that I should devote an hour or a day of my time to any personal partisan causes or to any duties other than the awesome duties of this office, the presidency of your country. Accordingly, I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Five days later, American morale is dealt another blow. At 6.01 p.m., Dr. King is shot and killed by a single bullet fired by a white man, James Earl Ray. In response, riots erupt in over 100 U.S. cities. New York Senator Robert F. Kennedy, campaigning for the 1968 Democratic presidential nomination, breaks the news of Dr. King's death to an audience in a predominantly black neighborhood in Indianapolis, Indiana. Almost two months to the day, on June 5th, Robert F. Kennedy is himself assassinated mere minutes after winning the California Democratic primaries. The government, both on and off America's shores, is in a chaotic state. General William Westmoreland continues to request additional soldiers in Vietnam, 200,000 more in what has become a war of attrition. President Johnson calls Westmoreland back with an offer to become Chief of Staff for the U.S. Army. Westmoreland's tenure in Vietnam has seen an increase from 20,000 American troops to 500,000. 
Removing Westmoreland directly from the Vietnam equation, he is replaced by General Creighton Abrams. Westmoreland's deputy since May of the prior year, Abrams takes a clear and hold approach to the war. His plan is to break units into smaller groups and, rather than simply go after the enemy, train the South Vietnamese forces to defend themselves. Is the war in Vietnam beyond the point of no return? America faces its own social uncertainties as President Johnson prepares to step down from office. With the military failure for the communists of the Tet Offensive and the U.S.'s own disenchantment, preliminary peace talks between Hanoi and Washington, D.C. quickly deadlock. Washington wants all North Vietnamese troops removed from South Vietnam, while North Vietnam refuses to recognize a provisional government in South Vietnam under the leadership of Nguyen Van Thu. The hope towards an end is overshadowed by America's distrust in its own government and anxiety over the war. With Robert Kennedy dead, pro-Vietnam Vice President Hubert Humphreys stands to take the Democratic nomination. In response, thousands of students converge on the Chicago Democratic Convention to protest the inevitable nomination. Anti-war demonstrators clash with police, the Illinois National Guard, the Army, and Secret Service over a five-day period. August 28th, the third day of the convention, is dubbed the Battle of Michigan Avenue. Chicago police beat, tear gas, and arrest protesters. 589 arrests are made, with 100 protesters and 119 police injured. Like with the Battle of Hue, the press coverage conveys the disorder in America. The Republican convention produces former Vice President and John F. Kennedy's 1960 rival, Richard Milhouse Nixon, as their candidate. Nixon paints himself as a stable figure who appeals to the socially conservative World War II generation in a bid to restore peace in Vietnam and rebuild the once proud America. The choice we make in 1968 will determine not only the future of America, but the future of peace and freedom in the world for the last third of the 20th century. And the question that we answer tonight, can America meet this great challenge? Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.